Good evening dear viewers and welcome back to the review program. In this episode we will discuss the role of law to deal with environmental issues, with more emphasis on climate change. The world is increasingly recognizing the urgent need to address environmental challenges, such as pollution, climate change and biodiversity loss. Various measures and strategies are implemented, involving technological innovations and grassroots initiatives. As of 2023, over 40 countries implemented 35 carbon pricing initiatives at regional, national and subnational levels. But despite the efforts, carbon dioxide emissions reached a high level of almost 40 billion tons. So how these problems can be regulated and what is the role of law on solving these issues? In recent years, several new environmental laws and regulations have been enacted worldwide to address pressing environmental challenges. The European Green Deal, implemented in 2020, aims to make Europe climate neutral by 2050. Key components include a climate law targeting a 55% emission reduction by 2030, a circular economy action plan promoting sustainable product design and waste reduction, and a biodiversity strategy to protect 30% of land and marine areas. The impact includes accelerated decarbonization and economic transformation. Formation. The Paris Agreement, adopted in December 2015, is a landmark international treaty aiming to limit global warming to well below 2 Celsius, preferably to 1.5 Celsius, compared to pre-industrial levels. It requires countries to set and regularly update their nationally determined contributions and includes mechanisms for transparency and accountability. The agreement has encouraged global commitments to reduce emissions and transition to renewable energy sources. The next one is United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity and the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, adopted in 2022, aims to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030. Key targets include protecting 30% of the world's land and marine areas and restoring 20% of degraded ecosystems. The impact includes strengthened global efforts to conserve biodiversity and promote sustainable use of natural resources. In a bold move to protect the nature, Uzbekistan has also made significant changes to its environmental laws, focusing more on reducing air pollution from businesses. These changes are now part of the Law on Nature Protection, Atmospheric Air Protection and Environmental Control. They outline when authorities can stop or limit the company's activities uh, to protect public health and safety. Before we delve into more details, we had a chance to talk with public on this topic. Along with new amendments and adoption of law on regulating climate issues, Uzbekistan is also focusing to raise public awareness and educate young generation to be more eco-conscious. Experts and professors are being invited to share their experiences and youths are grabbing the opportunity of attending global eco-summits. As part of this initiative, professor of George Washington University, Randall Abate, visited Uzbekistan to hold open lectures on climate change management and international environmental law. Uzeport TV also had the chance to participate and learn more about the role of law for solving environmental issues. The lecture that will be held in English is open to students, teachers and experts in law, international relations and related fields. During the lecture, more than 20 participants took part, where the discussion revolved around environmental law and the effective way of mitigating ecological issues. It is reported at the lecture that 34% of the emissions are coming from the energy sector, 24% from the industry and 15% from transportation. So what kind of human activities are now significantly challenging the environment? The human behaviors ultimately are the interest in developing economic gains and ultimately industry um, are our interest in comfort. Uh, so, so the fact that we're always in cars and in larger and larger cars and in larger and larger homes as, as economies develop, all of these have significant impacts on increasing greenhouse gases and likewise our reliance on meat as the primary focus of our food system also has significant carbon uh, implications for, for the planet and climate change. As the professor stated, the law is there to help with this kind of issues. How can these challenges be regulated? Requiring uh, countries and private entities to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases is one role that the law can play and we're seeing that with global regulation of climate change that there is a, a requirement that countries based on their own capacity reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases and then that they find ways to do that in a way that's appropriate for, to, to be able to meet their economic needs as they address this environmental protection concern. 
and then the law can also help um, countries and communities adapt to climate change. So climate change is something that we're not going to be able to stop through legal regulation. So there's a, a challenge that the law faces in enabling countries and communities to find ways to live with climate change. During the lecture, questions and answer session was also organized for the participants. To further discuss our main topic of discussion, we have invited a guest from George Washington University and Professor Randall Abbey. Hi, Professor, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. How is your trip to Uzbekistan is going on? Very well, thank you. Really enjoying it. Have you visited the ancient cities, monuments here? I was in the mountains on Saturday and then uh, next Saturday I'm going to Samarkand. What about your lectures are going on here with the students? The lectures have been great. I've really been pleased with the, the level of engagement and the questions and really, really enjoying it from a wide range of audience members. So let's start our main topic of discussion. Uh, can you please interpret the word of uh, broad term climate change with simple words? Well, climate change uh, is a phenomenon that involves the, um, the warming of the planet through the release of greenhouse gases. And greenhouse gases are uh, carbon dioxide and methane, nitrous oxides, uh, and, and um, HFCs, which is a substitute for the ozone-depleting substance, CFCs. So these substances, when they're emitted into the atmosphere, create a, a barrier um, that really traps heat in the lower atmosphere and it creates more of a warming effect on the, on the climate. And so with climate change, the, the real challenge is that it's caused by many sources. Um, so the release of those gases is, is from many different sectors in our economy. So it's different from the ozone depletion problem, which was just the release of one particular chemical primarily. So regulating climate change is very difficult because it happens throughout our society and ultimately it's causing many severe impacts that are affecting both environmental resources and uh, humans. So previously climate change was part of the environmental problem, but nowadays countries are focusing more on climate change separately from the environmental problems. What do you think about this? Yes, I think that's, that's understandable because of the scope of climate change impacts. Climate change impacts are uh, initially were thought of as, a, as an environmental problem like many of other challenges like biodiversity and ozone depletion. But over time we've seen that unlike those other problems, climate change um, really can't be stopped uh, or corrected, it, it just has to be managed. And so it's become more of a societal issue as well as an environmental issue because it has so many impacts on human activity, both economically uh, and socially. Uh, it's a driver of migration. It's a, it's a challenge for um, communities to have access to food and water. And so it becomes very much of a human rights issue as much of, uh, as it is an environmental problem. So, Professor, human factors have been always uh, the main contributors to the ec ecological issues. Uh, recently, nowadays, what kind of uh, main kind factors are now adversely affecting the climate? Um, well, certainly there was, there was a great debate about whether climate change is merely a natural process, which to some degree it is. We, we've seen uh, variations in our climate over um, many centuries where there are warmer and cooler periods, but then science was quite clear about how uh, climate change is a human-caused problem. And so what we're seeing is that it's through many different ways that humans interact with the climate that we are seeing the phenomenon of climate change um, become worse. Uh, uh, basically everything that grows the economic base of our uh, society is creating climate change and we're at a point where we can still develop, we must develop economically, but we have to do so in a way that's sensitive to limiting climate change as we develop. So Professor, as an expert uh, at environmental law, how do you think that uh, law can help on solving the environmental issues? Well, law is essential. Uh, law is, is really what uh, drives societal decisions, uh, how they can engage with the environment and, and in what ways and to what degrees. So I think where the initial response to climate change was very much 
let's reduce these greenhouse gas emissions. This is what's driving the problem, so let's create a regulatory system uh, globally that uh, limits each country's ability to emit these harmful uh, substances. So that was ultimately the approach in the first 10 to 20 years of the Global Climate Change Agreement. And then th this awareness grew that it was really more about adapting to this problem, it was really the best that the law could do to protect um, humans and the environment from, from what climate change was causing. So um, an example of that is really the way the law helps people um, relocate to, to a safer place if climate change is likely to, re to, to drive them out because of sea level rise or because of droughts or because of wildfires. We're now at a stage where the law is trying to get ahead of that and not simply allow people to respond to those kinds of environmental threats that will cause great disruption in terms of where people live and, and economic stability. So I think the law is more positioned now to, to help human society adapt to what we know is happening, what will only get worse, and find a way to still thrive economically, to still protect human communities in a way that they can survive and, and thrive. Can you please name some of the legal acts or conventions that helped many countries in this regard? Well, it's the, uh, the UN framework on climate change that started way back in 1992. And this global agreement created a, uh, a protocol called the Kyoto Protocol, which was really the mandate for all, virtually all countries around the world to address climate change by forcing them to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by a certain amount, by a certain date. And it was designed in a way that the global north, developed countries, would have more of a responsibility to uh, reduce those greenhouse gases than the global south, developed, developing countries. Um, and also, the, uh, over time, the challenge was um, when the Kyoto Protocol came up for renewal, there was a, a, a moment there, if you will, a few years where there wasn't um, certainty that the, the climate change regulation regime would continue at a global level. So then we ultimately got the Paris Agreement in 2015, and that's now the global agreement that is governing how, how nations address a reduction of greenhouse gases. And it's much more permissive than, than the Kyoto Protocol was. It allows nations to, to make more of their own determinations about what's possible within their economic needs to, to reduce um, climate change. And it's far better than nothing. But what we're now seeing is an era where domestic laws have to be much more stringent um, in other ways to address climate change and not rely exclusively on that global agreement because there are so many other ways that um, domestic efforts through legislation and in climate litigation um, cases uh, have other impacts on reducing uh, greenhouse gases in addition to that global agreement. So there are also terms of soft and hard law. Uh, how can we evaluate the environmental laws of Central Asia including Uzbekistan? Well as a member of the global community um, the hard law would come from um, both treaties that are binding and um, national laws which are, which are binding on, on the countries and, and the region. Um, and ultimately there's soft law which is more aspirational. It's, it's principles that, that the nations try to live by, but there's not that force of, of law to require them to do whatever that principle may require. Um, and so for international environmental law to work effectively, it's got to have a mix of those two things. In, in many ways, um, today's soft law becomes tomorrow's hard law. It takes a while for the global community, on, even on a regional basis like in Central Asia, to agree that there's a problem to address and then ultimately be agreed to, bound, to be bound by commitments to reduce those um, challenges. So in many countries, governments started to limit the construction, energy generation and transportation to protect the nature. But what might happen with the economy of the country? Because these are the main drivers of the economy. Yes, that's really the challenge that we see these days. And, and that's part of what's known as the, the, the just transition or the clean energy transition, where we're, we're trying to establish a win-win situation where, uh, uh, particularly in, in global south nations, um, 
uh, like in Central Asia, we want to ensure that the economy can continue to grow as it needs to, to meet the, uh, the needs of the people, but at the same time do it in a way that's sustainable, that is uh, protective of the environment to the maximum degree possible. And so um, one example of that would be cars are certainly uh, currently a, a primary mode of transportation, but uh, efforts should be made to promote more access to public transportation uh, and impart a transition to more electric vehicles and, and, and electric modes of public transportation would be a way to enable that, that growth and mobility to continue, but in a way that's less harmful than the traditional uh, gas-powered vehicles. Raising public awareness is, in this regard is very important, but don't you think that uh, this can cause a panic, especially among young individuals? Yes, that's, that's very important. So, so the younger generation is experiencing what's been called climate anxiety, that, that awareness that climate change is such a grave threat to their future that they're making decisions uh, in a way that's more cautious and, and, and filled with doubt. Um, and it's, it's really disturbing that um, the law can't do enough to protect them from feeling that way, but the, the law can be involved and, in fact, communication outlets as well can be involved in trying to help um, the public strike a balance between that sense there is an urgent crisis that we're facing with, with climate change, but there's also a reason to have hope, and, and the law is one of those elements to provide a sense of hope that the way we live our lives as individuals, as communities, as nations, we can do, uh, we, we can take measures that will make this situation less of a threat. We, we can't stop climate change. There will be um, challenges in the future that make living um, the way we currently enjoy very difficult because of the threats that climate change will pose. But that should really be a source of the glass is half full rather than half empty. It should give the younger generation a sense of, I want to do something to not only help my future be more um, sustainable and bright, but also play a role in society's efforts to, to challenge this problem. And that's really where, where Green University is a, is a leader in this regard, that being uh, established through a, a presidential decree um, by the president of, of Uzbekistan to be the first university to offer training in this kind of space, sustainable um, finance and, and uh, a master's degree in environmental law to really train this generation of learners to, to feel like they can play a part in making a difference uh, both, for, both for themselves and for their community and their country. And so I think that's, that's really encouraging and we're seeing, I think, a lot more of that in terms of this generation's career path choices. They, they, they want to be a part of a solution and that's, I think that's where the hope is, uh, lies. Well, Professor, the panic, because of this panic, many people, there are hopes and ideas uh, among many people to move to another planet mm -hmm. because of the environmental problems on Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think, to summarize our conversation, should we prepare for this move in the future? I, I think it's inevitable. It's just a question of how far into the future that might happen and also who would that include. And, and my concern about that is it may be a luxury only available to the wealthy, the global north nations. And, and to me, that's, that's not an adequate solution. I really think that uh, any solution that, that is a response to the climate change threat needs to be very inclusive, that, that all nations would have an opportunity to benefit from it. And there are other ways where um, climate geoengineering, which is, is a, a, a theory of, of strategies to address climate change in a very technological way, there's also danger where that might help the global north more than the global south because the global south might experience some of those adverse impacts of trying to address the climate at a planetary scale. Uh, all of those unknowns uh, likely would be borne by the global south much more than the global north. So that's the thing that concerns me a bit about um, those, those advanced climate fiction type of solutions to our challenges with climate change is that it's, it's going to raise some equity issues that, that could create disparities in who benefits and who doesn't. That was actually my last question. Thank you for your answers. Thank you for your time dedicating uh, for this program. 
was a great pleasure to talk with you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. These were the main highlights of how legal acts can contribute to mitigate ecological issues. Thank you for watching. Don't miss review program every Sunday on Uzreport TV. Thank you.